Hello and welcome to Compounding Curiosity. I'm your host Kalani Scarrett and this podcast is all about compounding your curiosity alongside my own through thoughtful interviews with interesting guests. For transcripts and detailed show notes, check out the links in the description. Hopefully you're as keen as me to learn something new, so let's get stuck in. Alright, how are we doing? My guest today is Ramon Pacheco Pardo. Ramon is a Professor of International Relations at King's College London and career chair at the Brussels School of Governance. He is also a non-resident adjunct fellow with the Centre for Strategic Studies career chair and a non-resident fellow at the Sejong Institute. He is also the author of Shrimp to Whale, South Korea from the Forgotten Water K-pop, which is today's focus. So in this conversation, we cover the incredible rise of South Korea, where the future lies for them, and his awesome and aptly named book. So I hope you have as much fun as me, and please enjoy my conversation with Ramon Pacheco Pardo. Cool, cool, cool. So let's get stuck in. Uh, Ramon, thank you so much for coming on. And I know you first came to South Korea as a student all the way back in 2003, but do you just want to elaborate a bit more on your background and history with South Korea? Uh, sure. Uh, I, I originally come from, from Spain, and it's fair to say that, that the, in Spain back back then, uh, there wasn't much interest or knowledge on, on, on Korea or, to be honest, uh, Asia in, in general. Uh, but I was intrigued by the similarities between the, the history of Spain and the, the history of uh, South Korea. Both of us, we used to be uh, poor countries uh, under dictatorships. Uh, and then we became uh, developed. And after becoming developed, there was a transition to, to, to democracy. So that's why I was interested in... In, in South Korea, of course, there was the World Cup at the same time, but I think that would really inform my decision to to focus on, on on the country and try to know more about it. So, so when I was a student, uh, my university uh, back in Spain had an exchange agreement uh, with a Korean university, with uh, Hangu University of Foreign Studies, uh, Hangu Gwede. Uh, I applied and, and I got the. Uh, the, the positions I was able to spend uh, a full year in, in, in Korea as a student uh, and that's when my interest in the country really picked up after being able to, to, to spend there uh, all that time. And then just to maybe wrap up with yourself, so from first studying in Korea to now, do you just want to give a quick background sketch of yourself and how you've transitioned over the years? So after studying in, in, in Korea, uh, I, uh, I went back to Spain. I was working for a while and, and I went to do, to do a master's uh, in Australia, actually, at UNSW, because they had a very good program uh, focusing on, on, on East Asia, international relations of, of, of East Asia. Uh, and, and I was able to do my master's thesis on, on inter-Korean relations. And that's when I decided uh, maybe it's something I want to do for the future. I want to continue to research about Korea and eventually... Uh, be able to to, to discuss Korea uh, publicly, right? Uh, after having uh, acquired more knowledge about it, so I worked for a while, and after working for a while, I, I went into my uh, PhD program, which was on uh, in the end it was on North Korea U.S. relations, uh, but I was always obviously studying uh, South Korean foreign policy, South Korean domestic politics. I had the chance to live in, in in Seoul for a second time. This time at Korea, I was studying at Korea, staying at Korea University during my PhD, and I was lucky enough that I got my job uh, at King's uh, straight uh, after uh, I finished my my PhD. Actually, a little bit before I finished uh, my PhD. Uh, so I could continue to to research uh, and write uh, about Korea. Then I got the Korea chair in, in, in Brussels uh, later on. So, so now I have the two jobs and obviously this allowed me to uh, dig deeper uh, into policy debates uh, in Korea as well. That's the type of position that I have in Brussels. And, and throughout this uh, whole time, I, I've been traveling to, to South Korea often. So before the pandemic, uh, I was able to go every, every second month and I would also spend the summers uh, in Korea, so long stays. Uh, and I can see that uh, once uh, since the pandemic is over for many and travel is back, uh, this is happening uh, again. So I'm going to, to, to Korea quite often uh, again and able to, to engage in, 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 in debates, conversations uh, in, in Korea itself, in, in, in Europe, in the US, in other parts of the world, about Korean foreign policy, Korean domestic politics. And throughout this whole period of time, I always thought, well, um, I would be interested in writing a book for the general public, uh, not an academic book, uh, about South Korea. Um, partly because when I first went to, to Korea myself, obviously this was all, almost 20 years ago, 
uh, there was nothing of, of, of the like. So, so when I was going, my friends, I remember they, they gifted me a couple of books uh, on Korea, but one of them was a normal travel guide, <laughs> the Lonely Planet one. And the other one was actually in North Korea. And this was because there wasn't much on South Korea that was not academic. And later on, when I was traveling myself often there, uh, I always felt, uh, well, we don't have a book that maybe tells the history of South Korea only, not of Korea, but South Korea only, uh, focusing on the transformation of the country, uh, as I said, for a general audience. And, and that's what led me to, to, to write the book. I will touch on the book. Just curious, who came up with the title of the book? Because I love it. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, well, it, it was my title, actually. So it was one of those cases that uh, I came up with the title first. And then I approach uh, the publisher, and the publisher reacted uh, because the publishers not not being experts on on on, on Korea, South Korea. They said, "Well, uh, within these captures, uh, what we think uh, <laughs> Korea, the way we think Korea has evolved, right?" So they really liked it. Uh, it's not that they knew the meaning of, of of shrimp among whales, the Korean saying, but they did like the uh, the analogy of a country, you know, moving from being small uh, and not very recognized. Uh, to be much uh, better known, right? And 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 I think the Forgotten War, to Cape obviously Forgotten War is, is how many call the Korean War, not only in the US, but also in, in Europe and Cape pop uh, everybody knows knows about it. So it was a case that I came up with the title myself, the publishers liked it, and then they said, well, now you have to, to write the book. Now you have to write 200 words, 203 pages uh, that, uh, that reflect the, 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 the title. Perfect. Yeah, it covers all bases. And just quickly for listeners who don't know, could you explain the Shrimp Among Whales quote? Yes, absolutely. Right. So it's this, this saying that, that there's in Korea that, that uh, Korea traditionally, when it was a unified country, uh, it was a shrimp, a uh, small country surrounded by the big whales. Uh, back then, of course, it was uh, China and Japan, so there would be uh, China and the US. And, and this saying goes that uh, uh, when the whales fight, uh, the shrimp has its back broken, right? And in this case, uh, the shrimp would be Korea, basically meaning that it wouldn't be able to, to determine its own fate, that it would be, uh, as I said, uh, China and Japan in the past, but today, China and the US that would be able to determine its own, its own fate. Yeah. And I'll ask this at the beginning, just in case it might lead us down some rabbit holes, but your favorite period or even moment in South Korean history? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I mean, I, I really like studying the, the, the 1980s, 90s, the, the transition to democracy uh, period, because it was a people's-led uh, process. And I found that very interesting how you saw different groups uh, coming together, uh, you have the student and uh, workers movement that had been present for democracy for decades, but that's the start of a strong feminist movement in, in Korea that also joins uh, this fight for democracy, among other things, uh, but also uh, normal uh, white collar workers, office workers that traditionally have been less politicized in, 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 in Korea, and obviously this group was smaller when Korea was, was poor, uh, that also joined the, the fight for democracy. So you had all these different groups uh, coming uh, coming together. So I think that's the one I enjoy the most uh, uh, studying and researching and, 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 and writing about. Yeah. And in the book, you made a great illustration on the growth after the war because I think off the top of my head, the IMF even called South Korea a basket case. So the growth from after the war, and you gave this great illustration just from someone being born in 1920 through to them turning 50. So could you highlight the changes they saw and what that looked like? Yeah, it's interesting you, you pick up on, the, on that because quite a few readers have mentioned that, right? Including many Koreans who went through that process and said, oh, that was me, <laughs> right, <laughs> back in the day. Uh, so, so, yes, yeah, so that, 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 that section, uh, I mean, I go back to someone who, who may have been born when Korea was under Japanese colonial rule, uh, who may have been sent to a Japanese mine as a slave worker, basically, or who was a woman who may have been a sex slave or comfort women, right? Sent to one of the of the stations that Japan had during the Second World War. Uh, so, so real suffering we're talking here, being a slave, basically, of, of, of another country, right? And then how this person during the Korean War uh, or after the Korean War, of course, uh, during the Korean War, they, they, they would have suffered uh, family losses. After the Korean War, they would have been really poor. And that's uh, exactly when the World Bank was saying, look, Korea is not, South Korea is not going to to grow it has no future basically uh, and, and and that person uh, would have had to work uh, extremely hard obviously uh, for, for, for his or her own sake uh, to begin with but also uh, for the good of the country for the country to become developed uh, and by the 1970s uh, this person would be living in a flat probably in some cases for the first time ever they would be able to live in a flat 
uh, they would have uh, a TV, a fridge, uh, things that uh, in other countries were taken for granted, of course, uh, you know, Europe, Australia, Canada, the US, but certainly not in Korea uh, at the time. Uh, they would be able to scrap some holidays from time to time, probably to Jeju, the island, of course, in the south of South Korea. Uh, and, and they would have a completely different life from, from the moment when they were born. I, I, I draw this uh, picture, uh, so to speak, on, on, on the book, uh, because if we compare with other countries that were already developed or where the development process took uh, hundreds of years, <laughs> really we're not even talking about decades, uh, this wasn't necessarily the case in other countries. In the case of Korea, this was this compressed development in a period of 30, 40 years going for, for uh, being colonized and extreme poverty to having a fairly middle class uh, life, a uh, fairly stable job, and as I said, being able to go on holidays, something that certainly hadn't been taken for granted by Koreans in, in history, really. Yeah, and it's the insane growth and how quickly it's all happened that's maybe what's fascinating to me, because I'll pull this from uh, your book. In 1953, South Korea was poorer than sub-Saharan Africa, then the poorest region of the world, and again, little to no natural resources. So some thought there might be better futures on the African continent, but... What has South Korea done differently or maybe done better than other countries that have allowed it to succeed then? Yeah, it's interesting because the comparison with Sub-Saharan Africa wasn't mine, actually. It came from, from official documents that I read from, from different institutions, right? Uh, in a sense, they were trying to say that uh, back then there were different parts of the world uh, that were really poor, right? And, and, and one of them was, was, was Korea, uh, the Korean Peninsula and South Korea, um, right? And, and, and I think uh, what South Korea was able to do is actually uh, three uh, things. Um, uh, one of them, he was able to focus on the basics. So something that even before the 1960s, even after the Korean War, there was this focus on, on having universal education, uh, both uh, girls and boys, actually, not only boys as happening in some other countries, uh, vaccination, for example. So, so kids basically wouldn't pass away, right, from, from uh, tuberculosis or um, uh, other uh, other diseases, uh, and also focusing on the development of infrastructure, so trying to build housing, trying to build roads, uh, railroads as well, so trying to build the basic infrastructure that any country would need if they want to, to export. And that would be the second uh, key point in the case of Korea, that uh, other countries, if you look, for example, at Latin America, they were focusing on this import substitution policy whereby they just wanted to, to get rid of foreign goods, uh, right, and, and, and produce domestic goods. But in the case of Korea, this was supplemented by exporting, right, by making goods that would be exported to, to, to the rest of the world. Of course, South Korea was not the first country to, to think about this. Americans have done it in the past, but South Korea really emphasized this in the 1950s, so from the 1960s uh, onwards, uh, and especially related to this, the emphasis on moving up the value added chain, because other developing countries, I wouldn't say they were happy to only focus on textiles, uh, shoes, etc., etc., but maybe they had the long term thinking to say, okay, how do we move to the next stage, right? Um, things like iron, for example, chemicals. Uh, sorry, steel, chemicals, later on uh, shipping, semiconductors, etc., etc. So there was this uh, focus on export about the long-term component. And I think the third aspect is um, the strong network that the government had uh, with the chevels that dominated the Korean economy, the big conglomerates. Uh, this had downsides, of course. Uh, there was corruption uh, and, and, and some chevels felt that the government was telling them basically what to do, at least until the 1980s. Uh, but it had upsides as well, which was you had these very big companies uh, that were able to receive the capital from the state, but then they were able to become internationally competitive. And if they had been a small, medium-sized enterprises, it might, be, might have been very difficult to scale up sufficiently to be able to, to export. Uh, so that, that matters as well in the case of Korea. Uh, and together with the two of them, of course, the, 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 the first aspect that I mentioned, you had uh, this long-term planning to have a healthy population, educated population, and then they, they were the workforce uh, for this uh, for this table that we're working together with the government. Yeah, there's a million different threads I could pull on there, but I'll start with the chebols. So could you explain, just for someone who's never heard of the term, what they are and then maybe why were they able to flourish and what's their function, I guess, in the greater economy of South Korea? Uh, yeah, absolutely. They are these big conglomerates that um, span many different sectors. So they can span 30, 40, 50, 60 
uh, different sectors. Now this gives them uh, a couple of advantages. Uh, one of them uh, is that they're able to attract uh, more capital because of their size, right? Uh, most of them are too big to fail, even though during the Asian financial crisis maybe this wasn't uh, the case, if we look at some of them. But for many decades we thought they were too big to fail, so, so obviously they receive uh, state support uh, uh, as, uh, as well. And, and the second characteristic, because they were in so many different sectors, if you look at a table such as uh, Samsung, we know them because of the semiconductors and mobile phones. But if you go to Korea, for example, they also do in insurance, uh, they're involved in the housing sector, so, so they're involved in all types of sectors. And, and of course, the advantage of this um, is that if uh, one of the uh, sectors is not working quite well, but some others are working better, right? Uh, this means that the table can survive, right? It's not focused on a single sector, and they are very diversified. Uh, and if one of them is not working well, they can cut their losses and focus on, 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 on other ones, right? And an example of, of, of Samsung that I just mentioned, for example, for a while, Samsung tried to get into the car making sector. This actually didn't, didn't work, right? But, but it's very strong in many other sectors. So the, the company didn't disappear. It was able to continue, right? So this allows for a long-term planning that it wouldn't be able if you only focus on one sector or, or you only had one. Uh, uh, one, one, one company uh, essentially in, in two or three sectors only. And you touched on some of the dark sides, which was corruption and the linkage of chair and the government. So could you maybe expand upon just some of the, the downsides or the costs of Korea's incredible growth? Like what have been some of the ill-intended side effects maybe, for lack of a better word? Yeah, I mean, um, obviously the, the reason, one of the reasons why the worker movement in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, wanted to transit to democracies because they felt uh, they were not represented by, by, by the regime. So that was a, a downside, right? In a sense, they were cheap labor, really, really cheap labor, right? Uh, earning very little. And they felt they were not getting the first share of the, of the spoils of, of economic growth. It is true that if you look at that period of time in, in Korean history, there wasn't much inequality, but it's also fair to say that uh, one of the reasons why there was inequality is because salaries were not very high, were low, actually, right? So, so that was a downside that, um, uh, you know, maybe in, 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 with a different economic growth model, uh, or is this like, it's a counterfactual, of course, but maybe workers would have gotten a better share. And it is true, actually, it's very interesting. If you look at Korean salaries today, the big growth came after transition to democracy, really, uh, late 1980s, early 1990s. Uh, there was this very in interesting a graph from the OECD that looks at uh, salary growth from, from 2000 until uh, 2020, right? And, and Korea is after Norway, the country with the uh, highest salary growth, real, real wage growth, right? Uh, and this didn't happen during the uh, developmental stage, right, during, the, the, during those years. And secondly was corruption. There was very big corruption. It was one of the reasons behind the Asian financial crisis of, of 1997, uh, 98, the, the strong links between state and, 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 and the chebol uh, and uh, Korean people knew this uh, of course uh, this was allowed uh, during the period of economic growth but at some point that that wasn't the case anymore right uh, people want a change and, and uh, this true it's interesting that if you look at for example you know, institutions transparency international it's very interesting that uh, today uh, Korea is not very corrupt by international standards right it's um, more or less at the same level as as, as you would see in, in Western European countries, right? But this wasn't the case uh, during the developmental years. So, so clearly was an issue uh, back then that, again, has only been addressed uh, afterwards, right? Uh, in this case, after a shock to the system as, as the Asian financial crisis. And yeah, for South Korea overall going forward, how bullish and excited or positive about, are you about their future? Because you mentioned they've moved up the value-added chain. So what is now, what in the past might have been steel shipbuilding now is semiconductors, internet of things. Because Korea's done very well. Over 50 million population. Economy is fourth largest in Asia and 10th in the world by GDP. So yeah, where do they go from here? Yes, I mean, that's a great question because of course there's a big discussion in, in, in Korea. I mean, it's not new, but uh, you can trace it back at the very least to the 1980s about to what extent uh, Korea can continue to thrive, especially in consideration that it is next to, to, to China, right? And, and China is also moving up the value of the chain. This has been a very big fear in Korea. As I said, it's not new. It has been there for 40 years. Uh, but Korea has been able to continue to innovate to an extent that hasn't been absorbed, so to speak, uh, by China. Uh, there was also a fear in the past that it wouldn't be able to, to compete with Japan. So again, that it would be a squeeze between high-tech Japan, low-wage uh, China. 
But now if we look uh, at Korea, competes at the global level, not only with Japan, in, in some sectors, in some sectors, of course, uh, Japan and other countries, US, Europe, other countries are more technologically advanced. But in some others, if you look at semiconductors, well, Korea is up there along with Taiwan, for example. Uh, if you look at the green shipping, uh, which is, I think, uh, the next big growth engine for, for Korea, uh, it, it leads at the global level, not in shipping per se, but in the more environmentally friendly uh, ships that increasingly we have to use uh, for transportation, right, at the, at the, at the global level. Uh, if you look at robotics, uh, Korea is getting up there together with Japan, which is probably the most advanced country in this in this sector, right? And now you see, uh, for example, after the, the pandemic, the biotech sector, right? So, so Korea, for the first time ever, really developing an indigenous vaccine, it wasn't able to export it. But who knows in the future, it might be something that is able to do, to do as well. So I think innovation really is, is where Korea... Uh, can thrive. Uh, I think it's uh, well known. There is a population decline. Uh, of course, some people see this a, as a challenge, uh, but then uh, I think there is a debate there because uh, it can be a challenge if there are less workers. But when we focus on the economy, something interesting that you see in Korea is the focus on these less labor intensive sectors because it doesn't have enough workers, right? And more focus on these uh, high tech, capital intensive sectors. Plus, for example, uh, something very interesting whenever I visit the increasing presence of, of robots actually uh, before it was in factories only but now you go to the airport or you go to a restaurant and you see robots because they simply don't have enough workers right so robots for example they will take your dishes you know once they are dirty instead of a waiter doing this because they don't have enough right so you have to reach the robot and they have to take it uh, um, uh, somewhere so it can be picked up right uh, so, so I think that's where I see the future of Korea going the, the, the innovation right and and and, and uh, innovation also on how to drive economic growth within the workforce because i i don't think even if the uh, birth rate uh, goes up is is not going to reach the replacement rate uh, doesn't happen in any developed country actually and and that's not going to happen in korea and i, I don't see korea open up to mass migration that's not really uh, on the cards in my view uh, we may be surprised but i don't think it's on the cards so so we're going to see this innovation in, in terms of how to drive growth in an environment in which you actually have uh, less workers as well. Perfect. I'm glad you mentioned immigration there because you've knocked out my next question. So my last question on the future of Korea before I get in, more into your book is, are South Koreans slowly giving up an idea of a unified Korea? Because, yeah, like you said, for the person from 1920. 50 years later, their idea of a unified Korea would be a lot stronger than someone like a much younger person might identify as South Korean first. So could you talk a little bit about that and your thoughts there? Yes, I uh, I think it's interesting. I think in the abstract, right, many Koreans think it's unlikely that unification will happen anytime soon and younger Koreans feel that this is not the way to go. Uh, that is true. But that's in the abstract. Uh, I think... When push comes to show, if it looks likely that this may happen, I think perceptions will be different. I mean, you saw this in, in, in 2000 when we had the first inter-Korean summit and people thought that the unification was coming soon, right? Uh, and people rallied behind the cause. But even in 2017, uh, sorry, in 2018-19, when we saw the summits between uh, Moon Jae-in and uh, Kim Jong-un, uh, and we also saw Trump, of course, meeting with Kim. Uh, and I happened to be in Korea for the first of those uh, summits. Uh, again, Maple rallied behind this saying, well, you know, this is something that may happen, you know, reconciliation and eventual reunification. So I find that very interesting, actually, because in the abstract, especially younger people feel, well, this is something that maybe we don't want to do. But when it comes to the possibility of this actually happening, no, you actually see that uh, this is something that uh, that would be supported by the people of, 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 of South Korea, right? Uh, of course, I'm not saying that North Korea is going to collapse anytime soon, but some Koreans said, well, we thought this wouldn't happen with the Soviet Union, or we thought the Arab Spring wouldn't happen, and then it happened. So what happens if there's a North Korean collapse? Then I'm pretty sure most South Koreans would, 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 would rally behind a unified, the idea of a unified Korea. Or even if, it's a, if there's a more long-term process in which you see reconciliation and the possibility of unification, uh, I think most South Koreans would support it. Um, but yes, as, as I said, in the abstract, I think there is still the, uh, there is this division between younger South Koreans who feel this is not the way to go and other South Koreans who feel we should still strive for it, yes. 
So with your book, you touched a little bit, but could you just expand on like what made you take that leap into the book? So you mentioned you came up with the title first, and then what did the process look like after that? I was writing it during the, the pandemic, actually, right? Because the contract was accepted shortly before the, 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 the pandemic. So in a sense, uh, I'm not saying it was a, 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 a blessing, but it is true that because I was at home all day, of course, with my family, but I was at home all day, I ended up writing at nights, right? There was no commute, there was no travel, right? So most of the process I tried to write during the day, but most of the writing was at night and right? But this allowed me actually to write it uh, fairly quickly in the sense that I had all the ideas in my mind. But because uh, I, I couldn't go to university, you couldn't meet anyone for lunch or dinner, for example, we're in lockdown, right? Or as I said, you couldn't travel. So that helped me to focus uh, my mind, right? To say, okay, well, I have, I'm going to be uh, at home for a long bit of time, so let's, let's write the book, right? And, 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 and that helped in, in, in the sense that I could write every day, right? As opposed to having to write two days, then you go away uh, for a week and then you come back, right? Uh, or, 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 of course, you're meeting your, your, your friends, right? And, and, and then you're not writing. So, so it came, up, um, came out very quickly in, in, in that sense. And I think from the beginning, I knew what I wanted to say. And I had been doing the research for, for many years, right? So I had the enough data uh, to, 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 to write the book. Uh, and I remember that I had only written academic stuff for the most part of everything opets of course as well but that's very different it's a thousand words max right so i kind of knew how i the style should be different by having read other books that were also for the general public right and how to eliminate all the academic jargon and, and, and focus on what uh, someone who doesn't know anything about korea uh, would like to learn but in a way that was accessible and i think that sense maybe um, it, it, it did help uh, the fact that I'm not a native speaker, right? So, so in a sense, I had to say, well, someone like me who is not a native speaker, right? Uh, there are certain expressions that may find it too complex, right? So, so I think that helped in that sense. So, trying to make it as accessible as pro as, as possible, I'm writing every uh, uh, every day. I mean, I went chronologically, so I didn't have to go back and forth because uh, I said I had a clear idea of what I wanted, what I wanted to say. And I had done all the research beforehand, so so I I knew where to find the exact information, the exact quotes. Uh, that I needed for the different sections. Yeah, and I'm not just saying this because I have you on the podcast, but I genuinely enjoyed the book. It was such an easy, like you said, it flowed through. And for me, like, I'm definitely not a career expert by any means of the imagination. So for me, I felt a lot smarter by the time I finished <laughs> the book and the way you presented it. So yeah. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> really enjoyed it. That was like, yeah. <laughs> just curious, so do you get the green light from the publisher, I don't know, at the very start and... What does it look like, their terms? Or even just like, what did they want the book to look like versus what did you want the book to look like? I'm just curious about that whole scenario because I don't know how it works. Yeah, that, 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 that's a good question. Yes, they were interested from, from the beginning, I have to say. So from the beginning, they were interested. Uh, and and uh, I mean, I, they, I, I gave them the, the, the concept uh, and they were able to check, obviously, my other my writings, of course. So, so uh, they could see my style, even though, as I said, this was very different because it was an academic, but... You know, they could see how I structure paragraphs, sentences, sections, etc., et cetera, which is important, important for them. Uh, no, and I have to say they gave me total freedom, I would say. You'd say, well, you are the, the expert. You are the one who knows about this this topic. Of course, once I finished, they, they went over it and, and there was a copy editor and, and they were saying, well, these things, this uh, paragraph, these sentences uh, are a bit more difficult to, to understand. What do you exactly mean here? Uh, but I have to say there wasn't there weren't many changes actually. Uh, as I said, I mean, if not total freedom, almost total freedom. To be honest, uh, once I gave them the parameters of what I wanted to to to, to write, uh, it was very easy to work with uh, with the publisher with Hearst. Actually, I have to say, so it was very uh, good process. Uh, and, and as I said, you know, the edits that they gave me were were minimal, saying, well, this we don't we don't understand, right? and we feel that readers won't understand this or this sentence, this expression. What do you actually mean? By this, or here, I think we, you've made a mistake because you know, it doesn't make, make sense to what you say elsewhere in the book. But there weren't that many edits. I, edits. I remember the copy editor mentioning that, right? That uh, uh, the copy editor felt that <laughs> they were being paid for the job, of course, but they were not doing that much. They said, No, don't worry. I mean, <laughs> I'm not going to complain about not having to make many, many, many changes, right? Uh, but I, I don't remember that as well. So no, very, very easy process. So, so uh, I, I was very, very lucky actually uh, with, with my editors, I have to say. So were there any unexpected challenges or 
hiccups in writing the book. You mentioned COVID, but that was almost like a blessing in disguise being able to write every day. But were there any other challenges, maybe not being able to travel to Korea and talk to sources firsthand? What was the hardest bit about writing the book? Yeah, that's a very good question. I prefer to talk to people in person. So, so I mean, I have talked and interviewed people over the years before the pandemic. But during the pandemic, this had to be done online uh, using uh, in software, sometimes by phone, right? Uh, yeah, and it's not the same. Uh, you know, I understand why people wouldn't want to talk for um, two hours on the phone or, or online or even one hour, right? And it's something that, you know, when you meet in person, you know, people may be willing to do that so, so, you, so you can get more out of of it. Um, I wouldn't call it a challenge, but yeah, obviously it wasn't uh, as easy as it would have been if I were able to just spend a few weeks in Korea uh, just talking to, 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 to people. Uh, I, I wouldn't call it a, a challenge though, because some many things change in Korea, right? So when I was writing the chapter about contemporary uh, South Korea, right, uh, the book ends up with the election uh, this year, uh, but, you know, it was the rise at the global level, for example, of uh, Blackpink. So it's something obviously I need to incorporate. It's not a challenge, but it was something else I need to discuss, of course. Then along came a squid game, <laughs> a parasite, right? I'm focusing more on the culture, but that's what happened, right? So at some point, the challenge was, well, where, where do I stop, right? Because there was always a new drama, a new movie. Uh, then also South Korea was invited to attend the G7, right? So it's like, okay, it's something I really need to discuss <laughs> this uh, in, in, in the book, right? So the challenge maybe was where, where do I actually stop? Uh, in a sense, it was the election. So, okay, let's stop with the election because then, of course, after the election, uh, you could have carried on, right? Uh, more things happening, right? Like uh, extraordinary attorney Wu, right? The new drama becoming successful, but you cannot just keep adding everything, right? Uh, and, and that was a bit of a, of a challenge. Uh, and the final one, which is a challenge, of course, you have a, a word limit. Uh, and I, didn't, I really didn't want to go beyond, beyond the word limit. So sometimes you have to make choices and you say, well, uh, this is interesting, right? But I don't have the space to discuss it. Let's say, for example, uh, uh, Korean mangas, right? Uh, which is something that has been, sector that has been growing, uh, right? Especially the stories that uh, people read on their, on, their, on their mobile phones, for example. Uh, oh, so like Webtoons? Webtoons, yes. Uh, yeah, I've forgotten the, the actual name, Web, Webtoons, actually. Because I simply didn't have the space, right? And and, and yes, I, I have a, a word limit that I had to to, to respect. Uh, so I mean, I, this came to my mind because a couple of readers uh, got in touch and said, "Oh, this for the next edition, you should discuss it." And said, "You're, you're right, right?" <laughs> so, so I had to focus on, on on other things or some historical figures. You were like, "Well, I I would like to to have two three paragraphs to talk about this person, but I really don't have the space. It will have to be one paragraph." Ah, okay. Wow. The more you know. So before I get into my closing round of questions that I ask every guest, is there anything we haven't talked about that's consequential about the future of South Korea, in your opinion? Well, I mean, I, I should have mentioned that when you asked me about it, but one thing I really discuss in the book in detail is the changing role of women in, in society, right? Not only in the, in the workforce. And that was very interesting for, for me to write because obviously I talked to, to uh, journalists, academics, uh, um, entrepreneurs, uh, business women, right? So, so many different sectors. And it was very interesting because uh, many women who I talked to, is like they said, well, I think this is something you should focus on in the book. But they also said, but don't treat this uh, in an overly negative way. They feel that this is being treated right sometimes by, 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 by foreigners, right? Uh, including academics such as myself in a very negative way and say, well, why don't you also mention the successes we have had over time? And I find that very interesting uh, because that maybe changed the way in which I wrote about this evolution of the role of women in society and, and, and in the workforce, right? So I do mention, for example, uh, a, a, a female entrepreneurs, right? Because I find that very interesting in spite of my research. And this came actually from talking to many of them. I said, well, uh, why don't you tell this story? You know, we feel very proud about you know, launching our own companies and, 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 and being able to uh, manage our own work Force and, and we feel that sometimes, uh, you know, as I said, foreign academics, foreign journalists really don't deal with this, right? And they just focus on the on the negatives, which of course still uh, still exist, right? And I find that very interesting um, um, that, that that process of how the role of women in society has has changed, and how many women uh, feel that this is something that uh, should be discussed more, right? Uh, not only the negatives, but it's also the, the positives, which they they rightly feel very proud about. Yeah, perfect. And to roll into my final round of questions, what do you think is an undervalued life experience or skill even that university age students don't give weight to? So like, yeah, what do you think they should have going forward? What do you think is pivotal? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a good question because uh, one of the things I recall back in the day 
Uh, I mean, my first degree was, was in Spain, so it's different from, from, from other countries, of course, it is the, the importance of my personal skills, right? Because uh, you get all the knowledge that you need maybe to do a job. But then, you know, once you join the, the, the workforce, right, you realize personal skills uh, do matter in some cases more, right? Because you need, for example, things like empathy, right? That they don't teach you at university, right? Then you will, you need to be able to put yourself in uh, someone else's shoes, right? Things like this. Uh, I, 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 I do recall that when I started to, to work, saying, well, this is something I wish I had no more of. And you can get this, of course, through, through internships, uh, work experience, right? Uh, uh, I, mean, I mean, for a while, for example, in my case, I, I work as a, a sales assistant, right? That helps so much, those type of things, right? But, you know, sometimes uh, it would be good if you are being, this has been discussed more openly in a university, right? Not only the academic knowledge per se, but all these soft skills that you are going to need later on, which I think are crucial. Yeah. And again, general, or even you can apply this to career if you want, but have there been either any books or people maybe that have been influential in shaping you and your worldview? Yes. I mean, um, I really like the book uh, by, by Gabriel García Márquez, the Cien de Soledad, 100 Years of Solitude, right? I, I mean, I remember that's a book that really marked me when I was read it back, back when I was a teenager. Yeah, and, and some people say it's the best ever book, the best uh, book ever written in Spanish. And I, I don't know if it's the case or not, but it's really, really good, right? Uh, and that helped me because I, I, I'm not comparing my writing to, to him, of course, my stretch of the imagination. Uh, but I really like the way uh, he was telling stories, right? And 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 later on, when it comes to my writing, uh, I try, as I say, I compare myself to him, but to replicate uh, the way he has of, of, of writing, I think the way he has of bringing different threads together and bring, putting them together, right? Uh, I really like that. So that really, I remember that really, really marked me. And I, completely different, but when I was little, I really liked basketball and my favorite player was Magic Johnson <laughs> back in the day. Yeah. Uh, and, and one way I guess he, he, he influenced me is that the, the way he actually put the team first, right? Uh, someone as talented as him. And, and then I've tried to apply that later on, you know, uh, <laughs> my, my different roles, for example, as a, a Korea chair, right? Try to, to, to put the team uh, team first and not, and, and, and not myself. Well, I'm successful or not, I don't know. But I remember that really marked me saying, well, you know, this guy could be doing everything by himself, but but no, he's thinking about everyone else, right? So, so I, I found that very, very interesting back in the day. So having now finished the book, what are the plans going forward? Um, yeah, what are you most curious about now? Or yeah, where are you planning to go, I guess? I have a, a couple of books coming out. One of them is, is very academic uh, on, on South Korean uh, grand strategy and foreign policy. And, and that one is, is, is very academic. It's, it's, it's not so much for, for, for the general public. Um, even though I, I from a time I, I see, you know, it could be policymakers, journalists interested, but it's not really for, for the general reader. Another one, and together with uh, Victor Cha, the professor at Georgetown University, and also uh, Korea Chair at CSIS, uh, we're writing a, a book for the general public in this case uh, about Korea's modern history, so late 19th century and until today. Uh, of course, uh, Victor is a good friend. He has written uh, a really excellent book about North Korean history, right? I have my book about South Korean history now. So in a sense, this kind of <laughs> complements what each of us has been has been doing. And, and both of these books are uh, are coming out uh, next year. So that's what I'm focusing on right now, uh, other than other responsibilities. But that's what I'm, I'm doing in terms of research and I'm writing. Perfect. I'll have to get you back on the podcast again next year then. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell Victor, I'm sure he'll be delighted to. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, just lastly, where can people find you? Obviously plug the book and where to find that. But yeah, anything else you want to cover? Um, I mean, uh, as you mentioned, in, 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 we discussed in the beginning, right? I'm, I'm, I'm between London and Brussels, uh, right? Uh, working at King's College and, and the University of, of, of Brussels. And uh, other than that, I'm in Korea really most of the time, right? as, as, as often as, 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 as possible. Uh, and, and the book, from what I understand, uh, I mean, it's available in bookstores for sure. I've seen it in, in, in London, in Brussels, uh, in the US as well, actually. Uh, in Korea, places such as such as Kyobo. But uh, many readers have told me that uh, in their countries, not for sale, so they just buy it online, right? I know in many European countries, I said the US, Korea is definitely available, but I, I don't know that many people are, are telling me, look, I, I just bought it online because uh, that, that was the easiest thing for, 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 for me to do. And I'm not going to name any platforms, but there are different platforms, of course, and, and that's where you can get it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, I won't name the bookstore then, but I remember I first saw it in a 
pretty massive bookstore in Malaysia, and yeah, it was front and center. Mate, you got good placement, so yeah. Oh, interesting because you know I I heard from friends in not in Malaysia in in, in Indonesia. So so and and from what I understand is because K pop is so big in the region, right? Yeah. yeah. So I didn't know about Malaysia. So something new I learned as well from this podcast, right? And uh, I mean, but as I said, I I, I do know that some as in Indonesia, other South Asian countries, from what you say. Uh, they're really interested in the topic, actually. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. Cool. Ramon, thank you so much for coming on today. I really appreciate it. I had a blast. And, yeah, cannot recommend your book enough to anyone. Thanks to you. If you enjoyed this podcast episode, be sure to check out the website, compoundingpodcast.com. On the website, you'll find every episode complete with transcripts, show notes, and other related resources. If you want an email notification every time an episode releases, plus my lessons and takeaways from each episode, be sure to sign up to the Substack. So that's compoundingcuriosity.substack.com. Either way, links to all content mentioned today will be in the description below. And you can also connect with me on Twitter, at Scarrett But until next time, have a good one.